I'd like to first of all welcome everybody to uh, the Regional Horizons webinar and in doing that I'd like to um, acknowledge the country we're um, uh, on today. Um, I'm in Wiradjuri country and I'd like to acknowledge the uh, elders past, present and emerging and the continued connection they have with their land. Um, today we're going to hear from Karen Stark on her experiences developing her farm with renewable energy and then we're going to hear from from Doug McNichol on research that he's doing in making the beef cattle industry more carbon neutral. So I'd like to uh, hand over to um, Corey now to well, introduce. Um, yes, I, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the, uh, the traditional owners of the countries that we are meeting on, uh, since we're spread across the continent. And indeed, I believe there are folk uh, from overseas who are joining us, which is wonderful. We have quite a mix of people today. Uh, sorry, I should introduce myself. I'm Corey Watts. I'm the policy advisor to FCA. Um, and yes, we've quite a mix of people today. Uh, we're a little bit late starting, so I won't wrap it on. Um, but welcome everyone. Uh, yes, do please, uh, with your questions, do use Slido. Please uh, try not to use uh, the Zoom chat. Um, and please turn off your microphone uh, unless you're speaking, because um, if you don't, we will, <laughs> just to keep things uh, neat. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, uh, FCA CEO, Wendy Cohen, and over to you, Wendy. Thank you, Corey. You can hear me, I trust. Yes, um, welcome everyone to the second instalment of our Regional Horizon Summit. I'm Wendy Cohen, as uh, Corey has mentioned, I'm the CEO of Farmers for Climate Action. Before we go any further, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the ACT, where I'm beaming from, um, uh, the Ngunnawal people. Uh, we acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and the contribution they make to the life of this city and to this region. It's wonderful to see so many of our long time and very valued supporters here today. Um, Jim Phillipson, Julie Armstrong, Rosalind Price, Anthony Houston, Jeff Wicks, Amy Hoover, Greg Hayes, Castle Hingey. Um, apologies to anyone we've missed. Uh, we also have some of our amazing farmers with us uh, as well today. A big shout out to Sid Plant, Bruce Curry, Joe Oddy, and also to the team and the board of FCA. Thanks for all of the hard work you do. So why regional horizon, horizons and why now? Throughout this pandemic and amidst great discussion, planning and speeches about the post COVID recovery and what's good for Australia, good for jobs, good for the economy. Farmers for Climate Action has been focused on one thing, making sure that the voices of farmers and their communities are heard. We're dedicated to making sure farming communities are not only supported through the recovery to deliver sustainable and thriving agriculture as, as we uh, move to the future, uh, but we're focused on what farmers um, are able to bring to, to the table in terms of solutions, practical ways in which rural and regional Australia may contribute in the most viable and productive ways, getting the country back on its feet. Farmers have low carbon solutions. They can lead the way on lowering emissions and they have practical outcomes already mapped to transition to a clean energy future and provide the foundations of a resilient community um, base across the whole country. To be frank, uh, when we launched Regional Horizons, it seemed that rural and regional Australia had been left out of recovery plans. Now we're seeing through farmer voices and also other programs and stimulus asks of other advocates uh, in our space that farming communities are moving into the mix. But it's not enough and we need uh, your continued help to tell our leaders that rural and regional Australians need support need consideration and need to be heard. I'm really thrilled that we've got Corinne and Doug here today. I know you'll be fascinated by what they have to say and we'll take much from their experience and wisdom. Thanks. I think you're on mute, Corey. 
Good on you, Doug. Sorry about that, folks. Thank you, Wendy. <laughs> um, not doing well today. Uh, let me just introduce Karen very briefly. Karen Stark is an irrigation farmer from Narromine. She's also a renewable energy consultant, and she's the founder of the National Renewables in Agriculture Conference, which was very successful last year. And uh, so there's no better authority to talk to us about the opportunities for renewables on farm. Over to you, Karen. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to first say thank you to um, Farmers for Climate Action for bringing this um, summit together and for inviting me to speak today. I'll just try and share my screen and we'll see how we go. We've had a bit of tech issues and internet issues, so um, hopefully it works. Okay, can everyone see that? Working. Okay, fantastic. So um, I will be talking about a bit about our own story and our experience with renewable energy as well as what some of the barriers are to adoption of on-farm renewables that, are, that we've been um, seeing across the country. Um, and also I'll touch on the large-scale renewables and ag debate just briefly, because I know that's something that's been coming up quite regularly. So this photo is a photo of my partner, John, um, in front of a, a diesel truck that is about a $30,000 um, bill at the end of each um, delivery. Uh, our farm used to solely depend on diesel to pump our water license and that that um, $30,000 truck would come every 10 days during summer. So we know that rising energy costs is a massive issue for many farmers across Australia um, and energy was the, was the biggest cost on our farm. And this really matters because it impacts on the, the viability of, of a farming um, business. Oh. So climate change obviously is also a massive deal. We don't need, I don't need to talk to this audience about the impacts of that on agricultural um, sectors. This photo was taken on our farm in December 2019. We used to see these types of um, dust storms every few months when the drought began a few years ago and then it became weekly. So again, um, with droughts becoming predicted to become more severe and more frequent, um, this impacts on our resilience and also farming sustainability in the future. But there are solutions to some of these problems that I've outlined. So this slide is taken from um, one of the speakers at my conference last year, Ken Baldwin, um, who, who's from the Australian National University, and he really sees Australia as a massive renewable energy powerhouse. We've got huge amounts of sunshine and solar energy that, that land on our surfaces and that that kind of green green dot there, um, the blue dot is a, if you covered that with solar panels would provide enough electricity for the whole of Australia with the green dot there um, being enough electricity for the, the whole of the world. So it's pretty significant opportunities that we have. So I'll now just cover off some of the barriers that we understand about renewable energy, um, the adoption of renewable energy. And this is both from research, um, my conference, some of the, the barriers that came out of the conference and also my own experience. Um, and I also work casually for a business called Reacqua Solar Pumping. So it's kind of some of the, the barriers that we're seeing come up um, through working with farmers. So the first and biggest one is lack of trust in suppliers. So while you might have a lot of businesses and suppliers that are, are great for you know, homes or businesses in the city, they don't necessarily have the expertise that they require um, to work on a smart renewable energy system for a farm. There's also a lack of understanding about the, about the feasibility and economics of these large scale renewable energy systems. Um, also in regional Australia, we often have a lack of skills, particularly around consultancy services to help farmers um, to do these types of systems similar to what we've got on our farm. High capital costs obviously is another big barrier. Um, while while the paybacks these days are very strong, it's, it's a significant upfront cost for many farmers. Um, there's confusion around grid demand charges and also an ageing grid that doesn't necessarily allow for um, the two-way flow of energy that we need to enable farmers to, to increase their use of renewables. And lastly, there's a scarcity of examples to learn from. So we know that farmers love to learn from looking over their fence at what the neighbours are doing in order to plan their, their business for the next in the coming years. And at the moment, um, it's quite an emerging area, the use of renewables or large scale, particularly um, for, for agriculture. So um, we need to be 
sharing that information through knowledge hubs or my conference so that, so that farmers can see that it is being done and there's opportunities there for them. So I'll just now talk a little bit about our story and, um, and, and who we are. So we have a irrigated uh, farm um, southwest of Narromine in the central west, so about two and a half thousand hectares. We grow 550 um, hectares of irrigated cotton in the summer months um, and we have dry land wheat or chickpeas um, over winter but obviously with the drought we haven't had much of a crop over the last two to three years. Um, so it's quite unusual now to look out the window and see green in the distance because it was just dry and dust um, over the last few years. So we have a ground and surface water license. Obviously with the surface water license and the drought, um, we haven't had an allocation over the last two years. So we rely predominantly on our groundwater um, license. And we have two deep water bores that, that pump that water for us to grow a crop over summer. And these pumps were previously driven by diesel. So that was costing us $3,000 a day just to pump our water license to grow the cotton. And as I said, the highest cost on our farm so this is the, the outcome that we're going for. So this is a cotton crop being um, picked by my partner in about um, May, and it provides about 80% of the profits on our farm. Oops. So I'll now attempt to, to do a video for you, which will give you a bit of an idea of the project I'll be talking about and the scale, see if it works. <laughs> From an industry perspective, I think it's really important that we demonstrate that we're adopting those sorts of technologies so that the people who buy our food, wear the clothes that are produced from farms like this, can be confident that we're adopting these technologies as we move towards a more sustainable future. So that just gives you a bit of an idea of, of what we did to overcome some of those high energy costs um, for, 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 for the diesel that we were paying over summer. So one of the barriers I talked about, lack of trust in suppliers. We, and I work partly now for Reacqua, but we started liaising with Reacqua Solar Pumping because they had very specialised and unique experience in the solar and the water pumping areas. And you need a, a business or supplier to marry up those two if, you, if you're going to get a good um, outcome because there might be many credible solar installers out there, but they might not have that experience of, of the way that farmers use energy, which is often very seasonal in its nature. Um, so they need to be able to design quite a smart, smart system. And REACRA really took their time to understand our farm operation um, and do up the business case for us, which showed, you know, what the economics, what the economic business case would be. So in terms of um, how much our system cost, it was 900,000, plus GST, so nearly a million dollars, but it had a very strong payback. So five year payback, um, and we're able to pump 60% of our water license using the solar only. Um, so, so we've had the system for about nearly two years now, and we're seeing $180,000 savings in diesel each year. So 180,000 litres 180, of diesel, so times by a dollar a litre um, when you, Look, when you take into account of rebates and taxes, that gives you about a payback of, of five years. Um, additionally to this, we were, able to, um, we were able to apply to be part of the renewable energy target. So we're accredited as a power system and that means we can sell large scale generation certificates. Um, and this sale of these certificates will give us about 100,000 over the next three years, three or four years. So that's been really helpful as well for the payback and to get it down. But even though I guess the economics um, of the project was what drove the decision to go to a solar diesel hybrid pump, um, what we're really proud of and what we're really excited about is the, is the reduction in CO2. So 500 tonnes of CO2 per year is saved because we're reducing the amount of diesel so significantly. And that's equivalent to about 40 households worth of energy use. Um, Hopefully you can't hear that screaming in the background. I'm just at a cafe, so I'm not sure who's, who's going in and out of behind that door. Um, so this is why I, I guess I'm really excited about 
about the transition of the agricultural sector to, to renewable energy because farmers are large users of energy. So that implies that we can make significant gains in this area of electricity. So the progress of our um, solar diesel pump was about four months. There's a couple of delays here and there, but it needed about a hectare of land to put in the um, 500 to 500 kilowatts, which is 1,550 panels. Um, and we launched this system to really high levels of media interest. Uh, at, the, at the launch day, we had Fiona Simpson from National Farms Federation, the Ag Minister at the time, Niall Blair come along. Um, and you know, there was, there was a lot of excitement about this being a step change for irrigated agriculture. But we, we're just not seeing, you know, both for the Reacqua side, as well as my own experience um, of the industry, we're not seeing that uptake of renewables as quick as you'd expect, particularly when there can be quite a strong business case like in our project. Um, and that's why, you know, I'm really interested in the why of, of why aren't farmers you know, taking up this opportunity like you'd expect. And that's partly why I, I convened the, the National Renewables and Agriculture Conference last year. So I spoke about the barrier of, um, you know, not a scarcity of examples to learn from. So this was all about bringing farmers um, together to share stories about what they've done and experts around building the business case and how to understand some of the opportunities. And it went really well. Um, like Corey mentioned, we had 280 um, registrations, which shows that the demand is there and the appetite for information. But, and we had about 250 people attend on the day and a real, um, real support for the event to be held uh, yearly, which is great, except this year, obviously. So it wasn't a great time to start a conference business because of COVID. So the next one will be the 19th of May, 2021, um, depending on how things go. So another important part of this conference was to bring together um, with the lack of trust of suppliers, um, which is one of the key barriers to the adoption of renewables, was to bring suppliers and some consultants together as part of the expo of this conference. And I tried to vet them as much as possible. Um, I checked their conferences, the Clean Energy Council checked if they're accredited or a member. And it meant that farmers were able to speak to these suppliers um, face to face to understand what they can do on their farms. So some of the feedback we received um, for the, from the conference, such as um, you know, the top left, which is access to manufacturers and specialists was refreshing and helped us with on-farm investment decisions, gave us confidence to look to move forward. So I feel like we met our objectives of increasing the knowledge of the feasibility, addressing the lack of um, trust in suppliers. And we evaluated um, post and pre and post conference on um, what, what farmers knowledge was of um, on-farm opportunities and that increased by 600 percent of those people rating their knowledge five out of five so i think um this this will continue to build that knowledge um and and connections between between people once this conference continues so that so that's one way i guess um that we're overcoming those those barriers to adoption and also gives you an idea of what we did on our own farm so I just wanted to touch on this because I've spoken a lot about how, how farmers and including ourselves have used renewables to cut our own costs, which is called behind the meter. Um, but there's also opportunities with hosting large scale renewable energy, like solar and wind farms. Um, and these types of developments are popping up more and more because our coal fire power stations are retiring over the next 10, 15 years. So we need to be, um, building these types of utility scale solar and wind projects. So for farmers, obviously, this gives a, a fantastic secure secondary income um, that, you know, during a drought, they'll still have that money that will be coming in and then will allow them to continue work on their farm, which then flows on to local economies. Because in a drought, farmers aren't going to be spending money on contractors or seed or fertiliser. But if you have that um, continued um, income stream it helps with with local economies as well and then there's there's a bit of an argument around um prime agricultural land being locked up for, for 30 years um for renewable energy development so the photo if you look on on the one with the sheep that's a farmer in dubbo um called tom warren he leases his land so he's got that secondary in income to a solar company called neoen and he's able to graze his sheep under the solar panels and this is a really positive dual benefit um, story because the solar panels provide shade for his sheep in summer, provides protection from wind and lambing season. And even in the drought, some of the condensation that 
collected on the panels um, would drip down to the bottom row and, and feed um, and provide, you know, green, a green strip of fodder for his sheep. So he only had to feed his sheep for three months, like over the two year, two and a half year drought we had in the Central West. Um, and there are additional benefits for the solar farm as well, because they don't need to use spray to keep the weeds down as much because they have the sheep grazing. Um, the top right photo is um, what they is commonly called agrivoltaics, which is combining crop growing with, with large scale solar panels and solar farms. And this is pretty common in countries like Japan, mm -hmm. Austria and the US. Um, they grow rice in Japan under panels, but a lot of crops can actually do better under panels. Um, this is, I think, wildflowers, and it's really important for pollinators as well, if you can use that land to help provide habitat. Um, but the soil mo moisture underneath solar panels has been, um, has been studied to be higher um, and less, less moisture is needed to keep those, those crops, um, I guess, watered. So there are really positive, you know, combining energy generation and agriculture and farming that can come out if we design our systems a bit smarter. And that just might mean, you know, spreading out the solar panels a bit further or using tracking solar panels so that you can um, put them kind of straight up like that when you're putting a tractor through or something like that. Um, so that's why I just wanted to touch on, on that. And I think I've come to the end. So thank you very much for listening. Happy to take any questions, obviously. Um, and um, yeah, my contact details are there. Happy to speak to anyone further. Good on you, Karen. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. And we do have some questions coming through. We've got about five minutes for questions. Uh, so I'll be expeditious. Uh, and also, I just want to say that we will post um, a couple of links uh, in the chat as we go along to uh, uh, augment the presentations. And one of them will be uh, a practical how-to guide for farmers on renewable energy that's been produced by the National Farmers Federation and the Clean Energy Finance Corporation. So, quick questions, let's go. So, uh, well, first, a, a comment, Karen. Um, uh, from Joe Oddy. This is, uh, she says, this is very compelling. We need to get you on New South Wales Farmers virtual conference agenda. So there you go. Uh, now, first question is, can you comment on existing, on the existing grid and how we, and I presume we means farmers, get large scale power to users? Uh, as context, Western and Central Victorian farms are facing a proposed above ground large scale transmission line to get power from large wind farms near Ararat to the west of Melbourne to Melbourne. Um, yeah, so that's, so the, the, the power grid at the moment um, is quite antiquated, obviously. It was designed for one-way flow of energy from these centralised coal stations out. And, but more and more now, you know, farmers with large-scale systems like ours, for example, but we're not grid connected, will want to be putting their energy back in. So there is a modernisation process going on um, to try and enable some of these um, updates in the transmission lines or distribution lines to allow that, that energy to be put back in. I know there are huge issues with Ausgrid in that Victorian area, um, particularly around, I guess, where these big transmission towers and easements are going to go. And that, that is unfortunately um, an issue with, with these updates that need to happen and upgrades. Um, but I guess it's a matter of trying to consult with those um, decision makers as to where might be the best place on a farm that, you know, some farms have got lower productivity paddocks than others. It's quite nuanced. Um, but, you know, I'm with the renewable energy zone, for example, which is um, out in my area, we're hoping that, you know, what comes out of that isn't just massive transmission and energy production that gets sent to Sydney, but it actually enables um, uh, a better distribution network so that farmers can put in a you know 200 kilowatt system they only might need you know half of it most of the time and it can go back into the grid to enable them to 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 get some income for that because at the moment export limits um mean that there's only a limited amount you can put back into the grid and therefore a limited amount of income um, but all of this is being looked at, at at a higher level um yeah i don't i hope that answers the question i'm not sure whether it does I think it goes a long way to it. It's, you know, your key point about the, de the design of the existing grid really does, um, you know, kind of militates against a lot of farmers who find themselves at the end of the line. And if we're going to make, uh, enable farmers to be not just buyers of power, but sellers of power, which they should be, we've got to reform yeah. that. And perhaps the community benefit sharing model that um, a lot of people 
uh, doing with wind power uh, might also apply to transmission lines as well. So where communities benefit directly and indirectly and share the benefits across the community. Um, are there any other questions? We've got a minute or so. I've only had that one that I can see. That's good. <laughs> if there aren't, I'm going to move straight to Doug because I know he's got to go at one. So I'm going to go straight to Doug and then we'll open it up at the end uh, for a, about 10 minutes of questions. So Doug, I'll, good, uh, good afternoon. Um, Doug, is, Doug McNichol is Sustainability Innovation Manager at Meat and Livestock Australia. He's an environmental scientist by trade and I know he's worked overseas as well as in Australia. He's going to talk to us today about Climate Smart Agriculture, which um, uh, is just a, really a framework that uh, is outcomes based. So productivity, adaptation and mitigation of agriculture's, agriculture's mission. So those three pillars and give us some really practical advice and bring us up to speed with what meat and livestock are doing. Over to you, Doug. You're on mute, mate. Okay. Thank you and uh, hello all. Can you hear me and can you see my slides? I can. Awesome. So presumably yep. We can see the slides, Doug, but they're not in the slide mode yet. Unless no, because typically crashes when I do that. So okay. I'm going to leave it like this. Fine. <laughs> uh, we're only sacrificing a small amount of screen. Um, so guys, I've been asked to come along and talk to you today about uh, rewards for climate smart producers. And I'll do my best to, to communicate that to you. Uh, and in addition to that, I'll, I'll cover off on some, some rewards or some insights that MLA have collected to, uh, to demonstrate that point. And then also talk to you a little bit about the technologies and practices that are available now and in the pipeline. And um, Karen's obviously gone into detail on renewable energy. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time on some other bits and bobs for you. Uh, and then also what industry needs uh, to drive change between now and some of our key deadlines under uh, industry and state and federal government uh, policy. Can't do that without just giving a quick recap on, on MLA. So we're a not-for-profit research and development corporation and we invest uh, producer levies, federal government funds uh, and voluntary cash contributions into research development, adoption and marketing initiatives that contribute to the sustainable development of our industry. A um, little bit of an overview of the industry structure there. So MLA at the, at the, at the bottom is a service provider uh, to a range of um, production uh, industry councils. So Alpha, which is the Australian Lot Feeders Association, uh, look after obviously the feed lotters. Cattle Council look after grass fed producers. Goat Industry Council look after goat producers and uh, sheep producers Australia. And at the very top, so the peak policy and strategy body for our industry is the Red Meat Advisory Council. In addition to those, uh, uh, those policy and strategy body, bodies, we do a lot of work with all stakeholders and that includes consumers and customer groups, communities more broadly, uh, as well as R&D and commercialization providers. Also just thought that uh, I'd like to try and introduce some of my uh, favorite food memories. Um, it's important to remember that we talk a lot about what we do on farm, but you know, we're in the food game at the end of the day, but also Karen and others will have you think that uh, we're, we're also energy producers as well as emerging environmental service providers. But uh, uh, this is um, you know, some of my, my favorite memories have been with friends and family, but also uh, my number one, uh, Georgia, and. Um, in different parts of the world. So I attended the Rugby World Cup last year with a, a group of friends and um, uh, we, we dined at Gonpachi Restaurant, which is the restaurant that uh, hosts um, the Kill Bill fight scene. If anyone of you ever came across the Kill Bill movie, um, it was great to go and see a, a unique dining experience in Tokyo. Uh, at the other end of the supply chain, that's, that's on farm, my family farm uh, at Jalaka in Queensland with beef producers there and that's, uh, having a barbecue with some um, extended family. And uh, this is overlooking uh, Acacia Bay in Waikato, New Zealand, um, where I was over there looking at some environmental innovations that are occurring in, in New Zealand. So I'd always like to set the scene with, uh, uh, with a food memory. Um, whilst we're at that other end of the, 
the supply chain, you know, as food producers, it's important to also set the scene around insights MLA captures uh, from domestic consumers. And each year we, we survey the domestic population um, to capture insights. And one of the questions we ask is, um, uh, which of the following best describes why you have reduced the amount of red meat you're eating? And it probably comes as no surprise to a lot of people that price, which is this green line, and health, which is this pink line, are the two key reasons why consumers choose not to eat red meat um, and remain to be, and have been and remain to be key drivers. In addition to that, um, there are some other concerns around environmental stewardship and animal welfare practices. And with that in mind, um, I want to want to also talk to you about how addressing environmental stewardship in particular can convert um, some real opportunities for, for our industry. Um, and now one of the key environmental impacts that, that we are currently grappling with is um, reducing net greenhouse gas emissions, but at the same time providing environmental services to it to uh, to the broader community. And we call that being climate smart. So um, if we think about the rewards that exist for climate smart producers, um, maintaining consumer and community support for Australian red meat. Um, so we can see increased demand and or value for Australian red meat that are enabled by some of our uh, actions we take in this area. Um, increased market access, um, in particular into markets like the EU that have uh, policy set in this area and they're gonna require that uh, countries that's, that's, uh, that they trade with also are taking similar actions in this space. Uh, access to capital, so um, increased access or lower cost of capital be available to businesses who take who place investments in this area. Um, we're reducing the risk of state or federal government regulation and intervention in this area if businesses fail to take action. So we're being on the front foot um, as an industry, um, putting forward environmental innovations that prevent the need for government to intervene. And also, you guys know that a lot of the technologies and practices in this area actually improve our ability to adapt our production systems and remain productive into, uh, into the future. And that's um, a, a key reward in this area. Important to note that you know, we produce red meat in Australia across 355 million hectares that isn't cost effective to produce any other primary product. And um, that's a really unique problem that Australia faces, and it's a great opportunity for Australia relative to other countries that have uh, variable um, rainfall and soil types that are amenable to other production systems. So I um, also like to remind people that in those big areas of red on Australia, um, extensive rangelands, um, the livestock production systems are the most economically viable by a, lot, by a long shot. Um, and with that comes great uh, expectation on how we act as environmental stewards um, on looking after that land. So MLA has been, um, have, uh, under the release of our new corporate strategy, which runs until uh, 2025, we're now really focusing in on how we can enable new sources of revenue for primary producers, red meat producers, alongside red meat production. And I've mentioned this notion of providing an environmental, uh, an environmental service. And one of those environmental services is uh, reducing net greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we can do that by two ways. One, uh, reducing emissions, uh, being a, uh, reducing emissions in the first place, and that's in production, feedlotting, and in processing systems, but also improving carbon storage in our landscapes. Um, so specifically through uh, new perennial pasture species, legumes, deep rooted legume species, and shelter and shade, promoting shelter and shade in the right areas in our grazing lands. Um, we know if we do that well by managing it as an integrated farming system, uh, we're going to deliver multiple benefits to farmers, to the community, to our animals um, that are going to promote the sustainable development of our industry. Um, we've made good progress to date. Um, we've been we set a baseline year for measuring greenhouse gas emissions in 2005, which is the baseline year for the federal government's commitments under the Paris Agreement. Um, and our net greenhouse gas emissions, that is emissions released minus emissions captured in that grazing land area I, I introduced to you earlier, 
had fallen 57% since 2005. Now, there's no sector of the economy that's come even close to doing that. Um, it's a unique service that our industry has been provided to Australia and to the broader communities. Um, and it's a, a, a great thing for us to hang our hat on as an industry in terms of our commitment and progress towards um, reduce, reducing net emissions. Um, so you're going to see a bit more of this in the in the short to medium term. In the longer term, we've seen a number of businesses introduce carbon neutral programs of supply. Um, and some of those have utilised this notion of carbon offsets. Some are taking action within their supply chain. So this example on the top right is North Australian Pastoral Company's plan to net zero emissions. And they're looking to invest in a range of technologies over the coming years. So you see on-farm renewables there, integrating legumes, use of new supplements, um, some genetic improvements, and then some further uh, uh, supplements. And you can see red asparagopsis mentioned here in the bottom right hand side is a, is a marine algae that this company at the bottom right here, Future Feed, good Aussie grown company out of CSIRO with um, uh, intellectual property rights allocated to CSIRO, MLA and James Cook University, where we um, have identified this marine algae you can see here in this person's hand, being converted into feed supplements uh, for our industry. So you're going to see more and more of, uh, of these uh, innovations uh, be released in the, in the, in the not too distant future. But and I'm just conscious of time. So I'm going to leave you with a few comments around what producers can be doing today. Um, now, first and foremost, MLA is a research and development corporation is focused on developing tools, technologies and information for producers to, to start to get their head into this area. Um, so there's some links here, which you'll get, you'll get this slide deck and you can access these links on the MLA website. Um, for you to provide yourself with the right information about emission sources on farm, what your carbon storage options are likely to be and how you could document these in a, in a carbon account that might complement your farm management system. Um, consider herd and, and flock management practices that you, that, and I know we do this on a day-to-day -day basis, but there are really important decisions you can make to Im improve livestock diet, um, breeder efficiency, to produce more meat for less resource input, um, and structure your herd in a way to reduce methane emissions per unit of output. Um, identifying shelter and shade options is really important on farm um, and that varies across different systems, whether you're in Southern Australia uh, versus Northern Australia versus Western, Western Australia. So there's some interesting tools that you can utilise to design shade and shelter options, um, but also looking to, look to establish deep rooted yet palatable pastures and legumes. All of these things you could be doing now. A couple of... Uh, uh, tools and, uh, that are also available to help you to manage um, when it might be able to rain and what climate events might be coming at you. These are some investments MLA have made in weather and climate modelling, uh, which uh, you can access through the Climate Kelpie website, uh, which require that link, um, and also a, a tool that we've developed through the Managing Climate Variability Program called Climate, which helps you track historic uh, weather event trends and, and plot your, your current season. So you can see how you, you're trending in relation to historic trends. I might fast forward a little bit now to um, some industry needs for us to, to reach some of our key goals like a carbon neutral 2030 industry. Um, and that might lead us into some questions. Um, we see three key industry needs for us to be successful in this area. One, a unified industry commitment to, to technologies and practices that have shown the ability to develop an economic proposition alongside an environmental one. Um, so ensuring that we're garnering that continued, that continued industry commitment. Um, the right policy settings, and when we say policy, we don't just mean government policy. Of the largest corporations globally, largest 100, only 36 are countries. The vast majority of, of, uh, of organisations globally who are taking action in this area are private entities and industries. So industry policy, company policy, are of equal, if not greater importance than government policy in this area. Um, also then goes without saying, new uh, and continued investment in research and development, but not just research for research sake, connected, 
coordinated and durational investments over the next decade to bring to life these technologies and practices that I've touched on very briefly uh, today. And I'll just leave you with that slide again, the, the rewards for climate smart producers, and perhaps we could leave that on or in the background as we're, we're working through questions. So thanks for your time and um, been great to speak with you and happy to connect with you further after today, if that would be of interest. Good on you, Doug. That was wonderful. Really good overview. Thank you very much. Um, and I should add, uh, in addition to the links that Doug sent, uh, and if we don't have them up on our website, we'll make sure that we'll remedy that forthwith. Uh, we'll also post um, shortly link to uh, our own Climate Smart Ag Toolkit, which uh, applies to livestock producers, but also more broadly. And we're always looking to, um, we, we appreciate feedback from producers on that. Uh, and, uh, you know, if there are useful links, uh, we'd really appreciate those too. We're trying to as best we can create a, a bit of a knowledge hub um, as a small outfit we can't do we can't do justice to extension but we're doing our best and hope that the word travels forthwith uh, sorry forward um, and I've got a few questions coming through and some of them are for Karen I'll just put those to one side for a second and and because uh, I know Doug's got to go in 15 minutes so we do have a little time um, and so please do send questions through Doug, the first question is, how did the industry achieve the 57% reduction in emissions? The primary uh, lever that was pulled there was um, revegetation in Northern Australia. Um, so the, the simple equation for our industry to achieve a net zero greenhouse gas position in the year 2030, as I've introduced briefly, was reducing emissions and improving carbon storage. Now, um, at this point in time, the market has been investing in, uh, in increasing carbon storage um, through various revegetation programs. Um, alongside that have been some large scale uh, savannah burning management investments. Um, we also know that those practices have a time and place and that uh, of the remaining emissions, of which there's about 50 million tonnes released per annum, about three quarters of that, so about 40 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent emissions each year are enteric methane emissions. So we're really focused now on these very innovative feed supplements, legume and feed base options that we know can chomp away at that number. But whilst they do that, deliver productivity outcomes for our industry. Mm. Because our modelling shows, or CSIRO's modelling has shown, that we can remain a productive livestock industry in the year 2030, so 24 million to 25 million cattle, 70 million sheep, and 4 million goats, and still deliver a carbon neutral position. Mm. And that's a very strong and compelling message. Now it's predicated on our ability to get these new technologies into the market. So, these new feed supplements. So I, I urge producers to keep their eyes out and ears open for those um, for those technologies and get involved in trialling them. So we're we're still going through a bit of research in, with some of those technologies at the moment just to validate the productivity benefits. Um, but once they're released, we would expect there'll be a, a, a very long uh, lineup of, of feedlots and producers who might be interested in trying that technology where it makes sense for them to do so, because it's not going to be for everyone either. So, uh, And the dairy industry, I know, Dairy Australia and others are also working similarly. Uh, correct. Yeah, yeah. so other. Fonterra have, um, yeah. are, are, are very interested in the future feed product. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you're going to see some the dairy industry get involved as well. And the ruminant-based industries, we're all in this together yeah. as, a, as a ruminant-based um, sector. And of course, Australia, is the second largest beef exporter. You know, our reputation really does, really does depend on this. So it's, you know, it's it's um, good to see work is underway. And and just through herd man better herd management alone, I think you could probably get quite a bit. I know um, uh, Jenny O'Sullivan, a, a livestock producer down here in Victoria, um, she says once we saw methane as energy and lost methane as energy lost from the animal that could go into production could go into the productivity animal. It really changed the thinking. Okay, so we've got a few more questions coming through. 
Um, so let me see. So one question is uh, about revegetation. So shouldn't we shouldn't we be aiming at higher levels of reveg um, and uh, longer term stewardship uh, over short term profitability? Do you want to comment on that, Doug? Um, or indeed, Karen, if you'd like to jump into. Yeah, just just repeat that question for me again. Um, so basically, I think this person is asking, why don't we gun for higher levels of revegetation, uh, vegetation management? Basically, yep. is, how do you see that factoring in? Yeah, so if we think about vegetation management, because um, it means different things to different people. So vegetation management, and when, when we talk about it, includes forest, woody vegetation, rangelands, regrowth, and replanting. There's a whole range of actions under vegetation management. Yeah. And the actions that are taken are, are ultimately driven by the economic model for those actions and the sort of environmental outcome. Um, and they're also driven by things like rainfall, soil type, etc. So um, in some southern systems, if you're in southern Australia, a lot where they have been vastly deforested a long period of time ago when we first moved to Australia. A lot of southern systems are very interested in re-establishment, so plantation type works, and often are in areas of rainfall um, and temperature and soil type that might allow that cost effectively. And I think there'll be a, a real emphasis on that. And there's been shown to be significant shade, shelter, animal welfare production benefits that can come alongside a carbon credit benefit, for example. Mm. Mm. Um, however, that's a very different prospect in Northern Australia. So the Northern Australian system, uh, of which, you know, if you look at forest in Australia, 30% of Australia's forests are in Queensland. Um, they've actually been, haven't been, have been severely underdeveloped. So um, the scenario up there is more a case around conservation of existing forests. But we've got to be realistic here that we're also in the business of food production. And conservation is important. And indeed, there's been a net increase in conservation areas uh, to the, to the not, I'm not gonna say to the detriment, but to the reduction in available grazing land areas in Australia in recent years. We've seen a net increase in conservation. We've also seen a net increase in woody vegetation um, in recent years to the point where by the time we get in the next five to 10 years to projection show that we will be back to any to pre-1990 land clearing levels in this country. So we're, we're on track to kind of get to our, get our conservation levels back to where they were um, in, in previous decades. And a lot of that will be enabled by um, avoiding deforestation in some areas, reconstitution or re, re, uh, regrowth in a lot of areas in Northern Australia, replantation in some areas in Southern, um, but again, needs to be done in a way that we've got an economically viable industry around it. And um, it's a complex problem to, to solve, which requires a number of considerations, but that's what we're faced with and that's what we're, we're getting on with. Um, mm -hmm. and um, uh, there have been attempts in the past to have federal environmental stewardship payments programs for, for farmers. There was one that was uh, going for a couple of years and then was discontinued. And I see now NFF and others are also trying to uh, get another one up and running, which would be good to see as well to uh, encourage and um, enable farmers to do that. Uh, we have a few questions coming through. Let me just uh, see, fire them at you first, Doug, because you've got to go. Uh, okay, this one, um, considering most farming businesses have a corporate structure and company directors have a responsibility to identify and manage all risks, uh, this person asks, you know, isn't it the case that being a climate smart farmer would help meet those directorial fiduciary responsibilities? Are people thinking of thinking like that from the corporate view? Yeah, absolutely. Good, good pick up. Um, I by no means profess to, to, have, to have communicated all of the rewards and um, absolutely. If you're, a, if you're providing governance at a, at a board level or above, um, you, you are going to see those duties reflect your, um, your, your actions, uh, and, you know, in, as a, as a, in, in governance. Um, indeed, they're already there. And those uh, in, a lot of com in a lot of companies, uh, those judicial duties reflect uh, the decisions that you make. And 
Uh, if you're a listed company or if you're utilising funds from a, uh, a large fund manager, uh, they now has to have to disclose um, their emissions uh, as part of their activities. And so fund managers um, uh, are, are now on the hook for this. And it's just another piece of information that uh, investors use to make investment decisions. But that's, that's at the very, the very corporate end. We've got, you know, there's 50,000 businesses that produce red meat in this country. Um, a number of them are corporates, um, but the vast majority by number are mum and, mum and dad businesses. And so for them, um, that, that's, that's less tangible, that particular issue at, at this point in time. However, you might see access to capital for bank loans. There's a number of banks who are now looking at different products to help um, evaluate um, their clients. And, and I, don't, I urge people not to be fearful of those products. I actually urge people to embrace them because what you then realise is that if you're increasing carbon storage in your farm, you're actually going to have better soil moisture utilisation. There's a range of benefits there. Um, but just realise that there are some decisions you might make that could compromise your agricultural productivity. So you just got to be careful about what decision you're making and why. Mm. Um, there are lots of, of win-wins out there if you make the right call. Mm. And, and, and that's right. And um, uh, enabling people to get their heads around those risks and opportunities and to manage or realise both. Um, I think it's a big task that uh, the private sector, public sector, and indeed we in the community sector have got to live up to. And that's part of the reason why in uh, our Regional Horizons report, we've called for a land and environment investment fund to, um, to top up those market drivers and also to, uh, you know, regional knowledge hubs so that people, people understand um, uh, the financial consequences and other consequences, benefits, um, and can and can access the the finance that they need. Uh, as you said, there are a number of banks already starting this. NAB Agribusiness has certainly been looking at this, um, and and I'm I've worked with investors who who are looking at their carbon liabilities and also looking at opportunities for investment. So the, the real changes afoot, and there are significant opportunities. Righto, stop rabbiting on. Um, uh, soil carbon. So the uh, question is, are there any viable soil carbon sequestration technologies that address permanency requirements? And someone also mentioned uh, the use of um, dissolved powder as a, as a soil um, condition or, a, or to help with soil carbon sequestration. Do you want to comment on those? Yeah, again, it's a bit like the veg management question. So, you know, what, what do we do with veg management? So, soil carbon is a very broad term. Um, and and let's be so let's be let's be clear about what the technology options here are. So the technology is the plant and the plant type. Um, in this case, in addition to any additives you might introduce into the plant system to promote the plant growth. Where we talk about permanence, permanence needs to typically be be decadal. So you know a couple of decades in time. Now that requires the plant to either persist above the soil for that period of time and not break down. And therefore, as it breaks down, goes back in the CO2 cycle, which most pastures typically do. Um, or the more dense woody plants, um, legumes, etc., trees uh, represent the, the vast majority of carbon storage above the ground. But underneath the ground, and um, you've really got to get part, our insights tell us, you've really got to get uh, depth of root system beyond or beneath the oxidation level in the soil. So where air permeates into the soil, it can promote um, biological activity that uh, enables those microbes to break roots down and therefore release the, the, the CO2 and methane back into the atmosphere. So getting plant structures into a depth below the oxidation level, which is typically around 30 centimetres and below, is where you get real permanence because it's not being broken down and re-released. So plants that are deep rooted and that are annual, are perennial rather, um, are going to provide those carbon sequestration and permanent solutions. Mm. So again, soil carbon is a very broad term. Let's be really clear about what the technologies are. And yes, there are, there are additives, um, a chemical, and even say chemical fertilisers, as well as natural fertilisers, if used in the right situation, are beneficial. 
because they do enable the, the carbon nitrogen cycle in the soil to kickstart it. And our soils are very poor, typically, compared to other parts of the countries, uh, other countries, and our rainfall is highly variable. So we're kind of pushing the proverbial uphill yeah. before we even start. Yeah. However, there are solution options there, depending upon where you are. Yeah, yeah, that's right. There are some good people doing really good work, but uh, those big drivers of soil carbon sequestration being moisture and temperature, they they're... now, mate, you've got to go very shortly. I'm going to ask. I'm going to shoot one more at you. It's to do with the um, now called the Climate Solutions Fund, previously the Emissions Reduction Fund. Uh, how compatible is the registration of a 2,000 tonne carbon dioxide per year abatement project? Um, how compatible is that, which is under, I imagine is under the ERF or now the CSF, with the scale of a typical farm? So I guess the broader question is how yeah. practical? I'll make an assumption project? that the person asking that question is, is, is um, well, the assertion is that um, the economics of weighing into the emissions reduction fund don't stack up unless you're producing that amount of credits. Yeah. Um, which is true. So that, that assertion as, a, as you know, that it's a problem is exact, is true. And uh, I think the federal government acknowledges that because the government at the end of the day want to buy these credits for Australia, right? Let's be clear. And that's why they want it. Um, 20,000 tonnes is a lot of carbon credits for a small business. Uh, I'd actually run the numbers here and, for my, my, my family farm, and we're nowhere near that number. Mm -hmm. um, it, it typically lends itself to large herds of a couple of thousand head and above, basically, mm -hmm. which from a market perspective is, 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 a, is a portion of the market, but it's not a large portion of the market. So the innovation that's yet to occur is, um, so the two things need to occur to overcome that problem. Either find a buyer for a carbon credit who's willing to pay more, so more than fourteen or fifteen dollars a ton, of which the Australian government is only one buyer, and they know that they are competing with an international market. Just like you sell meat to one customer, there are other customers for carbon credits than the federal government. So shop around, um, but do that knowing that we lose that from Australia if it's sold to an international market. We lose that environmental benefit. There are trade-offs. So the the think about the 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 price of carbon credits influences that, that 20,000 tonne number. Also, the cost of compliance, because at $15 a tonne, the cost of measuring and reporting and doing the things you need to do, again, use the analogy about what it takes to actually get your livestock ready for sale. You've got to do the same thing with carbon credits. You've got to do all the checks and balances, et cetera, et cetera, and that can cost about 30% of that unit cost. So of a $15 sale, you're actually only getting about eight bucks. And that can really then start to hurt the available or the profitability of the technologies and the practices that you deploy. So there's innovation occurring around reducing that transaction cost by aggregating projects, getting them together to share the costs in a coordinated way, just like we try and coordinate our supply chains as primary producers. Um, and there are also new technologies that help us measure things more cost effectively. An example of that is soil carbon measurement, which is notoriously difficult and costly, particularly in a grazing setting. Mm -hmm. But people are working on it, and that's R and D. <laughs> yeah, money will drive innovation, that's for sure. Uh, look, I've kept you, uh, we've kept you, uh, but I think that was a really important um, response that we needed to hear. Thank you very much for that. So, Doug, I'm going to let you go. You better shoot through. We really appreciate your time today. Uh, and uh, your contact details are there. We'll have that presentation up and people, um, I think you said you, people are welcome to contact you with questions. Uh, it's really good work you're doing. Keep it up. Good on you. No worries, guys. Fight. Keep fighting a good fight. Good on you, mate. Uh, folk, if you've got five more minutes, there are a couple of questions. And Karen, if you're still on the line, um, we have some questions on uh, renewable energy. Are you still with us, Karen? I am. Yep. Good on you. Are you happy to stick around for five minutes? Definitely. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Um, uh, and folks, if you need to go, please do. But we do have some questions, and I think they're probably worth it. So one of the first ones is, where are we at with renewable energy storage on farm, that is batteries, as opposed to returning to the grid? Yep. So this one I get asked a lot. Um, so for example, with our system, we had a battery. We, have, we produce excess solar at the moment. So it's a bit of an itch that we can't scratch. Like, What do you do with that when you're not connected to the grid? So batteries seem like the ideal scenario. Um, we had a battery um, 
quote from a supplier recently and it was about 600,000. So it's not, it's not viable at the moment for us to use battery storage. So there's also a lot of, um, a lot of activity in the hydrogen space and this is where things might um, be, end up being more beneficial for farmers because all you need is water, um, if you have solar panels, um, you know, it'll be, it'll be easier for farmers to produce hydrogen in the future. Mm -hmm. At the moment, um, we, for us, we also had a consultant look at hydrogen for us. And on a good day, the amount of hydrogen that we could produce, and that's like a storage battery, um, was only 14 kilograms. So that's equivalent. And then you can, that's equivalent to about 50 litres of diesel. So again, it's not really um, no. there yet. It's a bit pre-commercial with that. So while batteries can help with houses or utility scale, I think that mid-scale um, level of batteries just were a little bit further to go, even though battery storage costs are 80% cheaper than they were in 2010. Mm -hmm. So we are making huge amounts of progress and we will get there shortly. Mm, and thank you for that. I didn't know that about um, on-farm hydrogen. I know that um, uh, there's a lot of work being done now on, on big-scale hydrogen production as an energy storage and potential big export industry for Australia. Um, and thank you also for updating us on batteries. I know that there are, the technology is really improving, but we've got a little way to go and not applicable to everyone. Okay, so when doing the business case for the solar panels to replace your fossil fuels, what was the anticipated life of the panels and how did you factor that into your business decision? So the, the life typically for solar panels and for our um, calculations in the business case is 25 year life cycle. But at the end of that, it doesn't necessarily mean you need to get a whole new, you know, 1,550 panels because those panels are still producing energy. And the way that our system has been designed is that it, the 500 kilowatts um, is for a 250 kilowatt pump. So there is excess built into the system for those cloudy days or for the mornings and evenings because the price of solar is such that you can put more onto your, put more onto your system um, to try and make up for it. So... Um, I guess that was what our our payback and the the ROI and everything was based on that 25 years. But you know, in that time, um, when the 25 year mark comes up, there's probably going to be some really efficient new types of solar out there, um, which we might look at. But yeah, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the technology is really moving at pace, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, another one, uh, and I hope you don't mind um, sticking with us. Um, <laughs> How much income was generated from the sale of the large scale generation certificates? So, yeah, yeah, so we we're quite lucky. So we, what you can do with these um, large scale generation certificates is you work through a third party and they work with the uh, clean energy regulator. Um, so our third party was green energy trading and we locked in a five year contract with them in the, it might've been the end of 2017 or the beginning of 2018 on the estimated amount of um, energy that we would be displacing with diesel. So because we locked in that five year contract, the price that we have for, for the certificates at the moment, we're getting, I think, $56 um, per um, megawatt. Is that right? Yeah, $56 for a certificate. Um, so, at, and whereas I think if you look at the spot price or the, the price at the moment, it's very low, it might be $20 or $30. So therefore it, it worked quite well for us to, to have had that, um, that five year, I guess, contract. So uh, like I said, until 2022, when we first looked at what the sale of the LGCs would provide us, it's about $100,000. We're a bit, we're a bit late in, in starting um, and the, the kind of monitoring and getting that data for the clean energy regulator took quite a while, but so we didn't start at as high a price as we expected. We had to go the following year, but it's still um, providing a nice income and that will go until 2030, but then the, the certificate price prices might be nothing or $5 by then, but it's still an income for us. Mm -hmm. uh, and one more, um, uh, someone asked earlier, had there been any studies to show the benefit of solar uh, for agricultural production, and you you uh, flashed up that photo of integrated grazing and solar. And I've also posted a couple of links to articles, which embedded in those articles, you'll find the the research that I know there's been work done in at Oregon State University in the states, and also in Germany too, and I think in Japan. But do you want to make a comment on that? Yeah, and Arizona as well. In the yes, district. that's right. Yeah, that's right. So if I'm if I'm correct, but I'm not sure you can quote me on this. The the study showed an increase of soil moisture of about fifteen percent. Mm. Um, 
and also the water efficiency of the plants were about 325 percent yeah i remember those figures too yeah yeah okay, yeah so it's quite impressive and in australia we don't really have those re those kind of um research projects at the moment i'm mm. i'm kind of trying to push it for the renewable energy zones in new south wales i think that'd be a fantastic oh project. yeah yeah um but there is a lot of probably learnings we can take from overseas um there's a company called winergy in tamworth i don't know if you've heard of it but mm. they're yeah so they engineered their solar panels to be a lot higher off the ground so that you can graze cattle and sheep under there mm. Mm. And put a, a bit of a pilot solar panel thing on a one of the ag universities and they're doing some studies on biomass production under the panels and soil moisture mm. so that would be quite That's important mm. yeah well i'm glad somebody's doing that research because we really you know everything is it's all very well the germans and arizona and oregon but we need yeah. it here because we need it for our conditions okay. um all right i think we should wrap up um thank you everybody thank you karen thank you so much for today that was I learned a lot, that was great. Both of those presentations just blew me away, just the knowledge. Uh, and for us as um, community uh, and policy advocates, community-based policy, we need this, we need to be informed. And I encourage everyone, farmers and non-farmers alike, um, to continue exchanging information um, and, to, uh, and to exchange information with us and amongst yourselves, that's really important. And also to join with us in calling for uh, government and, as Doug said, industry to, to get behind the clean energy revolution and the climate smart ag uh, push as well. Thank you again, everybody. I will have links up on our website and presentations and so on and so forth. Really appreciate it. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you.